There were, there were two facts that you presented. I mean, there was. I mean, there, the the film is full of of incredible amounts of rigorous data, uh, but there were two facts that really stuck out for me uh, in in, uh, in in Gasland too. One was sort of on a micro level, and one was on a more macro level. On on a micro level, uh, basically, you found that uh, that the science says that when you drill a a, a well and you uh, put the cement around it to protect, presumably, the contaminants that are supposed to be in the well uh, and the methane from the water uh, supply, that the cement, the, the moment that drill, uh, that, that well is put into the ground, you have a failure rate at the beginning of 5%, and then it just gets worse. Yeah. Well, this is actually industry's own science. Um, the gas industry studied the problem of well leakage and well failure because they're losing their product. You know, if you drill an oil and gas well, you spend millions of dollars drilling an oil and gas well, you want all of that oil and gas to get up to the surface so you can transport it and sell it. They're losing big amounts of that. A gas well or an oil well or an injection well is basically just a steel pipe thrust down into the ground that's many, many miles long or a certain degree long, surrounded by cement. That cement is like a gasket. It's supposed to prevent oil and gas from coming up the sides of the pipe where it can't really be controlled. If it comes up the sides, it might go into a void. It might go into an aquifer. It might hit a fault and shoot up to the surface. That hole has to be cemented around the sides. That cement is on average about an inch thick. It's cement. Anyone who goes and walks down the street, yep. sidewalk, any place, can understand that cement cracks, especially if it's only an inch thick and it has to go two miles and it's subject to the pressure changes and temperature changes that are down there in the formations. The cement cracks very often. The cement uh, fails at a rate of about 5% immediately upon drilling. And then over time, that cement failure rate, the cracking rate, uh, increases so that after 30 years, you've got about 50 to 60 percent of these cement barriers failing. That means if you're drilling 100 gas wells, you're going to have five cement failures, five moments when there's the potential to contaminate groundwater if you're drilling through groundwater. Um, you know, so this is a very you know dangerous situation because each one of those contamination ep ep episodes can contaminate a whole aquifer. You're talking about oil and gas and, and having a vector for carrying those, all those things that are deleterious that are down there, salts, heavy metals, normally occurring radioactive material, volatile organic compounds, the gas itself, up into an aquifer through a crack in the cement. The industry knows this. The industry knows this because it's their own science. Uh, we uncover that science. In some cases, those were reports that were internal and industry documents that were not for the public. Um, and in other cases, these were published results in scientific journals uh, that were created by the oil and gas industry to try to deal with their problem from 10 years ago before this was an incredibly controversial. But here you go. You have the results. These are the numbers. And they fit what's happening in reality. We know in, in Pennsylvania, for example, there are 6,000 Marcellus wells that have been drilled. And we have about 1,000 families right now petitioning to the Department of Environmental Protection saying we've got water contamination issues. DEP has verified that 9% of the Marcellus wells that are newly drilled in the last three years are leaking. 9% over the last three years are currently leaking. That's, gonna, that's in line with the industry science and industry projections. This is real-world data of what's happening right now. And the engineers that are quoting this data who are former advisor, uh, Tony and Graffia to Schlumberger, former advisor, the number one fracking company in the world, former advisor to the Department of Energy, is saying there is no way to fix this problem. You can't adequately prevent it, and you can't always fix it. The industry will come in, and it will cost enormous amounts of money to try to fix them, but they don't always work. We have a family in Western PA, who we, we, we our central PA that we cover in the film, the G family, four generations on the same land. Uh, their neighbors signed a gas lease. They were forced to abandon their property. The Shell oil company, Royal Dutch Shell, the number one most profitable company in the entire world right now, drilled a six-well horizontal pad right next to them. That, that family of four generations had to leave. They ended up settling, signing a non-disclosure agreement. We suspect that they had to sell their house to Shell. Shell attempted to squeeze that gas well several times, three different times. Methane levels uh, would go down for a day and then shoot right back up. They could never fix this leaking well. 
uh, that family whose water was flammable, who feared what was coming next in terms of air pollution and the health crisis that would happen when you're living right next to an industrial drilling site, um, ended up having to leave. Of course. They, they, had, they had no other the, choice. The, the, the industry and, is not being honest and upfront about these things. And when you destroy an aquifer, you destroy it. There's no, there's no, there's no right. taking, there's no, there's no filtration that you can do there at that point. Now, yeah, on a macro you can't level, clean it. it's in the ground. This yeah. speaks to uh, President Obama's policy or notion that in some way natural mm -hmm. gas and we're being sold this, is a, is a great bridge technology if we want to get off of fossil fuels. Yeah. And in fact, this is not better. We're told that this is better for coal when it comes to, to, uh, to climate change, and that's not the case at all either. And you, you had, uh, there was one guy in the film, I can't remember his name, who had bought a special type of camera which could allow you to see methane yeah. leaking. It was fascinating. Tell us about that. Well, um, the natural gas industry will come in and say, we burn 50% cleaner than coal. What they mean is um, that there's half of the CO2, the carbon dioxide, emissions from burning gas as there is from burning coal. Now, that's true. And if in an ideal universe that would make natural gas half as bad for climate change and greenhouse gas and warming than coal. However, methane itself, the gas itself, is a super greenhouse gas. It's 100 times more potent than carbon dioxide at warming the atmosphere in the short-term 20-year uh, time period. So 100 times more. That means if you're leaking 1% of the gas, it's like burning the gas twice. What we're seeing now is leakage rates at the different parts of natural gas production and delivery that are far exceed 1%. In the field, we're seeing leakage rates of 4 to 9%. So where they're drilling the gas, they're venting off huge amounts of the gas in the field. Why? Well, when they frack the well, they pull out the water that they're using to frack, and in that crucial week, they're venting off. It's not connected to a pipeline. All the methane, is, a lot of it is venting off and exploding into the atmosphere, and there is a guy named Frank Finnan who uh, is not a rich guy. He's a woodworker. His wife um, died uh, early before they could spend their retirement fund. And he took $54,000 of his own money and bought a FLIR camera, to sh a camera that can see methane that the naked eye can't see. Methane is invisible. And he did this and went all around the country sh shooting gas wells as they're leaking. And he has some astounding footage of what happens when the fracking occurs. You see this uh, when flowback recovery occurs. You see these huge clouds of methane exploding into the atmosphere that you would not see with the naked eye. You wouldn't, they just wouldn't be there, but you can see them through this camera that Frank Finnan uh, spent his life savings on um, to protect his area. He's a central Pennsylvania guy. Um, his story's in the film. His, this cloud of methane erupting, and some scientists at Cornell got together and showed that they anticipated that in the whole natural gas delivery system, uh, between uh, Bob Howarth at Cornell, uh, between 3.6 and 7.9 percent of total production was going to leak into the atmosphere as methane. That means you're 3.6 to 7.9 times, you know, worse than coal if you're developing frac gas. The gas industry, and what we're seeing in the actual scientific measurements in the field. 4%, 9%, as high as 17% in the Los Angeles Basin, where you have production and delivery, 17% leakage. That's the product going up into the atmosphere. Um, the reason why is that in these processes, it's a gas. It's hard to control. That You have to be very, very strict in terms of how you're dealing with pipelines that leak or uh, the fracking process itself, which is uh, the gas coming up out of the well instead of getting that water into a pit, which is open air, and the gas is flowing out, you would have to put all of it in tanks. You'd have to all of it separate. It's much more um, uh, involved process, and a lot of the operators don't want to do it. Here's the, the problem is when you're going forward and you're saying, well, we're going to go in the direction of natural gas to solve our climate problem, as Obama's speech is, no one's happier than me to watch Obama earnestly and sincerely want to tackle the issue of climate change. It's enormously important. It's the most grave threat that we face on the planet right now. At the same time, he has got the completely wrong plan. The plan to switch from coal to gas doesn't get you a climate benefit in the long run. Um, and that's, or even in the short run, that's not good science. It's not good policy. We don't have the time. We, we, we were talking about developing natural gas fired power plants that would uh, be built for the next 50 years, 50 years of energy supply from this. That, we don't have 50 years to solve the climate problem. 
we've got to go after this and deal with this now. We're talking about projections that show dire, dire consequences by 2042, in the next 29 years, getting to two degrees warming. Uh, this is not something we have that, that time to, to mess around with. The good news is renewable energy technology can solve all of our energy problems, can provide all, all the things that we need. We have to vigorously make that transformation as a society away from the toxic past, away from dirty fossil fuel energy, and towards renewable energy. And we could do that. Americans love a challenge. It would be the next boom in our economy. We would truly achieve American energy independence because it's the wind, it's the sun, it's these things that you have a very hard time exporting. Um, you know, that could be the next revolution in technology. We saw cell phones change the world, the Internet change the world. We saw um, all, all these technologies come across and change the world. Renewable energy is waiting in the wings to be able to do this. Uh, it could happen very quickly, and all, all of a sudden uh, we can't do it, no, because the oil and gas industry – is controlling the way that the government operates. And, and that is essentially the real problem. We need real leadership that's going to come out and say, you know, enough is enough. Thank you for the last 100 years of energy, but we have to move on now because to continue to do this would diminish our standard of living, would warm the planet, um, would do all sorts of terrible things that we don't want to see happen. We need this to, to move on. We, we, we've got a, just a couple of minutes, but I just want to talk because, you know, as you're saying this, it's, it, it seems to me that there's also, and, 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 and you know, to sort of to globalize this fight in terms of, 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 of what we're seeing across a lot of different issues, and, and particularly in terms of our democracy in this country. You know, I, I saw a, a, a clip of, of you on on Bill Maher, I don't know if it was a week or two ago or last week, uh, uh, and yeah. with Niall Ferguson, the um, the just the, uh, the, the the one of the world's greatest economic wankers, as far as I can tell, and <laughs> uh, and and Jonathan Al, uh, um, uh, Alter, who is um, uh, one of those uh, people who is self-proclaimed liberal, but uh, always defers to the establishment uh, position. The, the 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 vitriol that particularly uh, Ferguson leveled at you the just the resent mm -hmm. and there was some of that yeah. from uh, Alter and you know Jonathan and I have debated on this program on issues like uh, like Medicare and Social Security which the fault lines seem to be very similar uh, although I think mm -hmm. you know halfway through that uh, conversation on uh, Bill Maher it seemed that you had turned Jonathan Alter uh, but uh, yeah. I the, I mean. I was just struck by how much this came down to a a fight that you clearly are incredibly well versed at this stuff. You've immersed yourself in this uh, this topic for five years. It took only moments for you to really make a fool out of Ferguson in terms of his lack of knowledge, but the pre the presumption that he had. I mean, calling you just saying you're a documentary filmmaker, you have no right to talk about this, I don't know what you're doing on this panel. I mean, it, it, it was comedic, but it really was this sort of knee-jerk establishment um, pushback yeah. against you. And I don't know if they have any uh, skin in the game, but it was like protect the moneyed interests at all costs. Yeah. I, I'm just well, curious what your take on that. Skin in the game is the right way to think about it. I think that we're living in two very, very different countries, a country that uh, ha is involved in th um, the front lines of extractive energy industry, which is fracking, mountaintop removal for coal, uh, the tar sands development, the Keystone Pipeline, the Gulf communities devastated by the Deepwater Horizon uh, blowout, um, and people who live outside of that. I think that when we're outside of it, we don't um, process this on a, in a deep way. The oil and gas industry is always considered a certain element of the population expendable in the face of uh, their exploits. Um, how did their coal, uh, our coal, get under their mountains? Type of thing, you know. Um, and and I think that there are pundits on both sides, conservative and uh, liberal, and uh, however you want to term it, who get a issue sheet on an issue and look at talking points and then go out and argue them. And one look at uh, Neil Ferguson, and I, I, I just knew that he had no idea what he was talking about. Yes. Um, that it, and and which, you know, that he had no real experience in doing this. And that as an investigator, I've been out there looking at this for five years as if my, my own life and my friends' lives depended on it, and that's really the case. Um, 
And, you know, so uh, one look at the guy, and I kind of knew that he was going to rattle off a bunch of talking points that didn't make any sense. Um, but at the same time, the vigor that he went out there with, I think, un- undid him um, b- because he-, he couldn't defend himself. And then when, once, you, once somebody attacks your credentials, you know you've won the argument. Right. But, you know, once you start to get to ad hominem attacks, you know that it's kind of over. Um, but at the same time, it is really scary because Neil Ferguson has written banner pieces for Newsweek and for other publications advocating for frack gas when, in fact, it's just numbers on a spreadsheet and it doesn't translate into reality. It doesn't make sense. This is the distance uh, often that, um, you know, uh, on those kinds of shows that you have um, in, in between somebody who really uh, has experienced this in those firsthand and people who are called in to commentate or whatever. The problem is that that distance also exists in Washington and it's exploitable. Um, our representatives, as hard as many of them try, don't always have that experience. They don't have that expertise. They rely on what's being told to them. And in this case, you know, Neil, Neil Ferguson is getting the same information from the gas industry and from economists and so on who are looking at numbers um, that don't really add up when you actually look at them as the president is getting, as our representatives are getting. And when you're dealing with thousands of issues, uh, literally, you know, you're not, you don't get the time. What we're doing right now is appealing. And as I did to Neil Ferguson, I said, look, hey, I'll tour you to these areas. I'll take you. After the show was over, we, we were having a drink, actually, with the whole Bill Maher staff. And I said, look, I'll take you to central Pennsylvania. I'll take you to meet these people if you really care about it. You want to see what it's about. I got his business card, and I'm, I'm serious about that invite. In the same way, we're Well, you've got to President update Obama us on whether or not he takes you up on it. I mean, you know, the, 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 the parallel between... I mean, this is a guy who it was was attacking the notion of stimulus based on the fact that uh, he thought that uh, Keynes was gay and therefore uh, childless because he thought he was gay and therefore did not care about the future, uh, and that's why he was willing to promote stimulus. I mean, this is a well, guy who wild. is, is um, so— but, I mean, we've, but, but, but getting back to planet Earth for a second, <laughs> we've actually asked President Obama— to please meet with the scientists and families and engineers in this new film, the families who are emblematic of thousands of people who are suffering at the hands of this massive drilling campaign, the scientists and engineers who are going to say, look, this is not a solution for climate. This is part of the problem. It's a big part of the problem. These wells are going to fail. This is a huge water contamination issue. This should not be your legacy. We know that he's met and his administration has met with the natural gas industry many times. We're just simply asking, let us bring you this information in the same way that, um, you know, I've been trying to do this uh, in a lot of arenas. It's like, look, let us educate you about what this really, really means. And then you go forward and say, okay, we want to do this surely or not. Surely he must have heard um, this from Sheila Jackson. At least that point, had the access. I mean, surely he must have heard this all from Sheila Jackson, right? I mean... It- from from Lisa Jackson. Lisa yeah. Jackson. I, I, don't, I don't know. I don't know. I know that Lisa Jackson, very tellingly, resigned after the election was over. Um, I know that she was a, a, a really a champion of people who were trying, who was trying to uh, uh, fight uh, uh, or investigate the industry in in her way. I mean, the the politics of regulation is always couched in a certain type of incrementalism. At the same time, you know, I do believe that she sincerely cared about these issues, and she was out there to try to represent the people. Um, the Environmental Protection Agency shouldn't really be called the Environmental Protection Agency. It should be called the People Protection Agency, because that's what it does. It protects our environment from us being chemically and, and uh, toxically harmed by industry that wouldn't care otherwise. And I think she was trying to fulfill that mission. I am very worried about the future of EPA. Um, as, I, as I was extraordinarily saddened by watching it fall apart in the face of any industry pressure during the filming of this, this new film. Indeed. Well, uh, Josh Fox, the, the film is Gasland 2. It's available on HBO. You can go to gaslandthemovie.com. Thanks so much for taking the time. And, uh, you know, congratulations on, on the fight, uh, the Delaware watershed. And, and just, Thank you. I can't tell you how much I appreciate the work that you do. Hey, and likewise, it's always a pleasure to be on. I appreciate it so much. Thanks. Thanks, Josh.